Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Walking in His Words. I am Kwame Thomas, one of your local leaders in the Andrews District of Churches. Now, you have been following us, so let me not ask if you have been, just to say that you have been, and thank you for taking the time to invite you, to invite us, rather, into your homes, into your spaces, and we want to welcome you to tonight's program. If you have been looking at last week's program, you recognize that we are now looking at salvation by faith. This is the one to the third one in our overall list of, of essays that we're looking at, the shibboleths of the faith. And so we have looked at the sanctuary, we have looked at Sabbath, we have looked at the state of the dead. So now we are on shibboleth number four, salvation by faith. And for that particular discussion, I am going to be joined by um, Prof. Giles, Colin Giles, he's no stranger to us, and also Dr. Noel McLennan who's a little new to us, but, you know, he, we have seen him commenting online, um, and so we encourage you to do the same thing as well. Remember, we are live, so you can always post your questions, your queries, your comments, or your concerns. But before I go into tonight's study, I will first pray, then welcome two panelists that are here, and also to remind you that you will hear a voice from time to time in the background that will be the voice of Sister Shanae Clark who will be reading your comments, your queries, your concerns, so that we can hear and they can be addressed. So let us just have a brief word of prayer. Eternal Father and our God, as we come before your presence, we want to thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to enter into these sacred spaces, dear Father. We pray that the families would have been edified for having allowed us into those places and that you will be glorified above all. Bless us to this end as we seek and pray earnestly that these words may find lodgment in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, gentlemen, welcome. Welcome back to Walking in His Word and welcome to Walking in His Word officially, um, Dr. McLennan. So, we started looking at the symbolics of the faith and we are now at salvation by, by faith. Um, I'm tempted to say salvation by grace, but it's salvation by faith. So I want to just take this opportunity to welcome you both and I look forward to a very robust discussion and I'm going to now allow you to give your own welcome and then I'll go over to Sister Clark. Thank you, Elder Thomas, for your kind welcome and introduction and thank you so much those who are joining us online. It's my pleasure being with you this evening again, and I look forward to us having a wonderful exchange. Thank you, Dr. McLennan, for being with us this evening. Thank you very much, Elder Thomas, and thank you very much, Professor Giles. I am also myself looking forward to this discussion, as it is quite pivotal to us as Christians, and it is one that is a topic that is most important to us and to our faith. And so, yes, indeed, I'm looking forward to this discussion. And thank you again, Elder Thomas, for inviting me to be a part of it. All right, so it would appear as though the pleasure is all mine. So <laughs> let me capitalize on that um, and to say, Sister Clark, it's been a while since we have had you before the camera, but you know, all in due time. So you will hear that voice um, from time to time. And so we can start by welcoming those of you online. I recognize earlier that Petal is, is there online, so I want to welcome her and to welcome all the others who might not have yet typed anything in the chat. Just a reminder that you can type. You can type in the chat and we'll be able to see it. Um, I'm not sure. I know I promised that last, last week we would have been... Um, we would have been, we would have started with the comments or the queries or the questions or the concerns that you might have had. So in a, in a little while from now, we're going to throw to Sister Clark, who will be able to tell us what you have said to, to us earlier. Um, I remember the, the thing that stuck out to me last, last week was um, Kelvin. Kelvin, Kelvin, he made, that's the last statement I remember looking at. So... I'm not sure if you're, if you're going to start there, but you could start from the questions that were there. Um, and just to say before I ask you, I hope Kelvin is there again. He's all the way from Kenya, I think it was. So right in the homeland of, of our ancestors, uh, one of the homelands of our ancestors. So we can start with the queries, any queries that you had from last week. 
Well, um, good night, viewers, and thank you again for joining us. Last week's queries were answered. I do believe that we had some comments. Mm -hmm. um, one such comment was from Godfrey Cohen. Yes. He spoke about, um, he said that it was indeed impossible for Christ to sin, not according to the great love wherein he loves us. Do not forget for a minute that he was born without Adamic nature, holy before and at birth. So um, that was one comment that we said that we would address for yeah. him. So I guess we can start with that. Yes, um, we can. So, gentlemen, I am of the opinion, based on, based on the statement that, um, that Brother Cohen would have made, that, and it sounds funny, now, but follow me for a second, Adam was not created with the Adamic nature of which, of which Brother Cohen speaks. Because most times when we talk about the Adamic nature, we're talking about the post-fall, the post-fall Adamic nature. We have to remember that when Adam was created, he was a perfect being. And a perfect being sinned. And because a perfect being sinned, it therefore means that Christ, when he was here, if he had the nature of Adam pre-fall, he would have also been a perfect being. And if the Bible is correct when it says he was tempted in all points as we are, but yet without sin, it also presupposes or it implies that he could have sinned. However, he chose not to sin or he tried to live. Well, he did in fact live above the sin that could have actually beset, that, well, the sin that actually besets all of us. So I'm not sure what your take is on it, but that's what I think. So I think I can throw over to um to brother mclennan first and then we'll come to to you brother giles yes thank you very much elder thomas now i believe let us take it straight from the bible mm -hmm. um, hebrews 4 does in fact say that for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So directly interpreting this verse, if Jesus was tempted or in a situation where he could be tempted, then the natural follow on from that is that there was a possibility that he could have yielded to, this, to these temptations and therefore sin. But the Bible thankfully has reassured us that Jesus, although he was tempted in all points, just like how we are, he did not sin. So Jesus was in his human form still exposed to the temptations and could have sinned. The, the, the human flesh could have yielded to sin. Mm -hmm. he was not, it was not a situation where it was impossible for him to sin. Otherwise the Bible would have clearly said that to us. And that would have made it quite unfair for us human beings. If Jesus had come and was in a situation more advantageous, they put, mm -hmm. than the, all of us human beings. That it, it would not be, be, be equal for us mm -hmm. to say, okay, we can also be perfect as though Jesus was perfect. Ah. So, so does it make sense then for me to say it was possible for him to have sinned, but it was improbable that he would have sinned? Because understanding the, 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 the project, let's call it project, yes. the project that was set before you and, the, and the, the gravity of what is there to be done. And that would have been the reason, in my mind, why he would have sweat such great drops of blood. Because when you see that the whole world, sorry, the whole universe is yes. dependent on you successfully completing this mission, yet still the, the weight of this mission is so much that it was, it's improbable that you can or you should 
or you would sin, but it's not. It's it's fully possible. I, that's me. I do not know if I would want to bring it down to a case of probability. Okay. Because that lends itself to to human machinations and mm -hmm. and and working out. What what I would like to to believe, um, in as much as how the Bible has stated it, is that Jesus had complete dependence on his Father, mm -hmm. much the same way that he has explained and expect us to have dependence on him to have victory over sin. Uh. From James, you see, that's what I was talking about. When, when I say improbability, that's what that I was hinting at the fact that um, right throughout the Bible it says that Jesus came and lived as an example for us. I think Peter yes. says that in his, in his book as well, where it, it shows that Jesus lived a life where if we should follow how he lived, how he taught, then we would be all right because it's improbable. It's impossible for you to live the way he lived and yet still live a life of sin. Yes. That's, that's, what, that's my view. But what do you say to that? Yes, um, I fully agree with the point, the points that um, Elder McLennan made that indeed Christ could have sinned. I just want to give a little background to show some of the reasons why it's important for us to understand that Christ could have sinned. Christ went and lived the life of a regular human being so that he is able to bear us up when we are going through our temptation. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. It says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered hmm. being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. In other words, because he has gone through what we go through in our temptation, he knows exactly what we need and he knows exactly how to help us. So, so that's one dimension. Then there's the other dimension of him being a faithful judge. Because notice what the Father says, what Jesus says of the Father in John 5 and verse 22. It says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Why would he do that? Because of justice and to understand how it is important that the person who is going to judge us knows and understands what we go through. Yes. Look at what Job said to God when Job was going through his distress. Job chapter 10, verses 4 to 6. Listen to what Job said. Hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as man seeth? Are thy days as the days of man? Are thy years as man's days? That thou inquirest after mine iniquity and searchest after my sin? Job is saying, look, God, can you judge me? And you have not a clue as to what I am going through? <laughs> yes. uh, Granted, God had to pull Job up. Yes. When God spoke to him out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness, darkness counsel by words without knowledge? That's Job 38 verses 2 and 3. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. You will answer. And God did not try to give him an explanation, you know, because guess what? Job, in a sense, had a point. Yes. 
Yes. Christ had not come yet. Mm -hmm. And so God could not refer to Christ yes. coming in human <laughs> flesh to say, come on, man. Yeah. You don't know what you're talking about. I've so, done this. Right. So yes. what God did was to pull him up and say, listen, what, what do you know? Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? You're talking as if you know anything. Right? But by the time Christ came on the scene and lived as a man, then the matter is settled. And that is why God will commit all judgment to the Son. Because Jesus, the Son of God, having lived in human flesh and having gone through the types of experiences that you and I would have gone through, he is in a position not only to provide the help, mm -hmm. but when we refuse the help, if he's we do, justified. he's justified in saying, look, this one has rejected me and you know, he cannot receive eternal you, life. You know what is fascinating about that, and, and I don't want to, min, um, to diminish, um, diminish his role um, as mediator, no, but Jesus is what you can call the great equalizer. And here's why I say the, yes. the great equalizer, because those before him, look forward to his coming in yes. faith. Yes. And those of us here look back at his action. You know, so Calvary right. and Jesus Christ dying on that cross is the great equalizer because at the end of the day, the same faith that Abraham required is the same faith that we are required to exercise. Indeed. So, so both of us have to look now, because when Jesus was talking of Abraham, and that's a good commendation, by the way, you know, Abraham longed to see my day and he saw it. Yes. So, you know, it was highlighting the importance of the prophetic vision where Abraham was able to look forward to say, all right, then this is going to be um, the Messiah. And he got that opportunity. So it's just an idea for us to just look, for, look, look back at the act of Calvary and see and, and invest your faith there. Start there and look at the Christ that came, the Christ who Philippians, um, Philippians 2 verse 5 says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of, death of the cross. Now remember, when you look at the death of the cross, Deuteronomy, Moses says, curse is anyone who hangs on a tree. So that was, the, that was the worst kind of death you could have had because it's a signal that you have been cursed. But then what's more than that? You had the cross that was made of the material from the tree. So you're doubly cursed mm -hmm. now because the Carthaginians plus the Romans have come together and they have concocted this most gruesome form of death. And this is where they put the savior of the world. So he had to be the showpiece for the entire human race. So, you know, I love that fact. I mean, it's painful that it happened. But technically, I'm kind of happy that it did. Um, I'm, I'm sad that he had to go through it, but I'm happy that it did because I now see the importance of it. And for any one of us there who calls ourselves Christians, we should be looking. I won't say you won't ever fall, you know, but we should be looking at that fact and that act and say, all right, so how can I now lean into you and be a better version of myself and to become what you have intended for me to become? Yes. And, and to, to tie in that point, Ella, Thomas, um, that's why Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, but without faith it is impossible to please God. So to follow on to what Prof had just mentioned regarding Job, a person in his position, and many others, there is no other way but by faith that such a one could see God's benevolence. And similarly, those who would have come up after Jesus had come on the scene, there is no other way but by faith to see Jesus' benevolence to all mankind. And to tie it in even further. The image of the cross, it has to be one of sacrifice. There, is, there are many ways that one could be offered up, but it is impossible for a particular person to crucify himself. 
the nature of the cross itself, that person cannot offer himself as a sacrifice in that respect. Somebody has to present him and nail both hands, fasten both hands stretched across and the, and the legs stretched down. It is impossible for, for, for the sacrifice himself or itself as it would turn out to be before Christ to, to offer themselves. And so as, as such, it will take faith, faith believing in such sacrifice that such a one would love us so much to redeem us from sin and Amen. to save us from, from eternal doom. Amen. Yes. And if I might just make one additional comment about faith, as um, Dr. McLennan pointed out so aptly, as it is said in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, that without faith, it is impossible to please him. And Hebrews 11, 16, you read it. Um, 11, verse 6, I mean. 11, verse 6. Yes, 11, without verse 6. Faith, yes. Right. It is impossible without faith. And it is important that we please God. Yes. We must do his will. <laughs> yes. And um, as it has been said in um, Matthew chapter 7, from verse 20. Matthew 7, verse 20. Right. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone Who that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of yes. my Father which is in heaven. Yes. It is by faith that we are able to do God's will. And that is what we, we need to recognize in that verse. For without faith it is impossible to please him. So faith enables us to please God. And that is what is mentioned in Romans chapter 8, that it is by faith, by having the Spirit of Christ in us, that we are able to please God. Look at what it says. It says, um, Romans, 8. Romans 8 and verse 8, so they that are in the flesh cannot Please God. Mm. And what is the difference between those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit? It says, because the carnal mind, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. So the carnal nature cannot please God. Why? Because it is not subject to the law of God. So when we are subject to the law of God, when we make ourselves subject to the law of God, yes. we are able by faith to please God by having the spirit of Christ mm -hmm. in us, without which we cannot be saved. Because Christ says, it is those who do the will yes. of his Father who are going to be saved. And saved. Not those who simply say, Lord, Lord. 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 Yes. So, so just, before, just before we throw back to um, Sister Clark, um, when, you said, when you said in verse 7 of Romans 8 a while ago, but the carnal mind is enmity against God, I am immediately drawn to James, James 4, verse 4, where it says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, enmity with God? God. So right. whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy, enemy of, God. of God. There's no line to tow there. There's no fence to perch on. And wow, well, let, me, let me just allow, let me allow, let me allow <laughs> Sister Clark to, to, to throw us the questions or the comments from YouTube. So let me first go to YouTube and welcome Sean Barnes Wilmot, Trevine Little, and um, John Phillips and Garfield Cohen. Now John said that we also need a next of kin in the judgment ultimately. Judgment will be given to the saints, mm -hmm. Daniel 7. Um, Godfrey also said that the statement made last week that our sins are put on the devil is incorrect. If Jesus took our sins the cross, from the cro on the cross, what sins are there that is placed on the sanctuary? Um, 
So let us look back at the, the whole sacrificial system. When, when, we, when we consider the sacrificial system, our sins are confessed. Um, so so let, let us put it my way now. I am the one who went to the sanctuary. The priest is there. I have placed my own hand because we are the ones that do the, the, the sacrifice in ourselves. You know? yes. We put our hand, we lay our hand on the, on the head of the animal, the innocent animal. Then we confess. Then that animal is slaughtered because we have confessed our sins on that. And the wages of sin is what again? Death. Death. All right. So that animal has died in our stead. But then there comes a time when the blood is taken and the blood is sprinkled in the sanctuary on, on something. But if that wasn't enough, there comes another time when you have two goats. You have the Lord's goat yes. and you have the scapegoat. What happens when we get to that section? Because we understand that the sins of humanity, Christ bore our sins in the flesh. But remember now that there is someone who is the father of all these sins, of yes. all these lies. And at the end of the day, all sins lead to him. So in an effort to save us, Christ died. Yes. But he has no savior, speaking of the devil. So at the end of the day, all sins will be placed on him at the end of the day so that him, sin, death, and the grave will be cast into the lake of fire. But that's just me, me just saying it that way. Yes. Um, so you are the learned scholar. Well, if, so, I could just, if I could just elaborate a little bit on the mm. point that you so ably made. Um, in Leviticus chapter 16, let us let us go there. Uh, right. You want us so Leviticus chapter 16, sixteen. Um, any particular verses? Start right. With? It explains what happens on the day of atonement. Mm -hmm. The day of atonement is the day in which sins, all sins, are mm -hmm. finally removed from the camp of Israel. On that day, as you mentioned, there are two goats. One is the Lord's goat, and one is a scapegoat. The Lord's goat, the blood of that animal yes. is shed. And it is by the shedding of the blood of that animal and the sprinkling of the blood that the sanctuary and the people are cleansed. But after that happens, notice what it says, verse 20, Leviticus 16 verse 20, and when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. The reconciling of the sanctuary and all the elements there was on account of the fact that the sins of the people were transferred there. And so that is what made it necessary for the sanctuary to be reconciled because the sins of the people were placed there. And so the sanctuary needed to be reconciled or cleansed. Mm -hmm. And that's in Daniel as well. That's right. And then it says, when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the, all of that, verse 21, towards the end of verse 20, he shall bring the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And then it goes on to explain mm -hmm. that the fit man, mm -hmm. after letting go the goat into the wilderness, to die out there, never to come back into the camp with the sins that would have been placed on him, the fit man must now wash his clothes before he comes back into the camp. And the camp is now clean. Now, this goat does not represent Jesus. No. Because this goat takes the sins mm -hmm. 
out of the camp and the goat himself is banished from the camp never to return to the camp so he's so, in the wilderness as it were that's yes. correct so it's but, not like christ who died this goat no his blood this is, is not a live shed. goat this is the live goat his, his blood is not shed at all and so it's important to understand why this is so and I, I, I know I'm taking a little don't, long, but no, don't, go, don't go, go there. Don't okay. go there. Oh, right. Just keep your finger there. No? Yes. What I want to do, I want to go to Revelation 20, 20. verse okay. 2. When right. you go to Revelation 20, verse 2, um, it says, He laid hold of the dragon, right. the serpent of old, yes. who is the devil, devil. and Satan, and then bound him yes. for a thousand, thousand years. Yes. Then verse 3 says no, and he cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on, on him. Listen to this part now. Yes. So that he should deceive the nations no more right. till the thousand years were banished, that were finished. Yes. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Right. So this goat yes. is now the serpent because That's we see right. where Leviticus 16 said it that way and then Revelation is now saying that they're talking about the same thing. Of course. And, and that is a very mm -hmm. good reference that correlates with what we just read. The sins being placed on the scapegoat and is banished and yes. in a wilderness and this is basically what happens to satan at the end uh, um, during the period of those years okay. but i want us to turn to numbers chapter 15 where we see the treatment of sins mm -hmm. from verse um, 27 it says, and if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly, when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord, to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. But notice what it says in verse 30. But the soul that doeth aught, just to say anything, presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. Notice the last part. His iniquity this is not sin, no. shall iniquity. be upon him. Mm -hmm. So in other words, not every sin goes on Christ. It is the sins that are confessed. That goes on Christ. That goes on Christ. Mm -hmm. Those who do not confess their sins, those who are deliberately rebellious. They have no savior. They have no savior because... Christ is not bearing their iniquity. They will bear it themselves and they will perish with the devil in the lake of fire, which the Bible says was prepared for the devil and his angels. But those of us who allow our sins to be placed on Christ, who allow him to bear our sins for us, who confess our sins to him by his shed blood, our sins are transferred to the sanctuary, which is to say that in the sanctuary, our sins are dealt with, our matters are considered, and we are acquitted because of our repentance and our dependence on Christ. And those sins are placed on the originator of them. Amen. And that is why the sins are placed on the scapegoat, representing the fact that Satan who instigated these sins and caused them to be committed, they will be placed on him and he will bear the ultimate penalty for them. Amen. Well, Professor, before you go on, yes. um, let me just read a few comments that came up while you were speaking. Um, Elder Philip said, Amen, Professor. Jesus did not escape death. Right. Um, Chanel Ellis is asking, who is the fit man? Oi. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting question. You know, you notice the fit man was someone from Israel. 
Yes. yes. And so, in the last days, God is looking to his people to be fit, having embraced by faith the righteousness of Christ and by receiving the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live righteous lives. We will condemn sin as Jesus condemned sin in the flesh and by so doing make it evident that Satan is not welcome among us. And that fit man is the 144,000 who the Bible says in their mouths were found no guile. No guile. And they are without fault before the throne of God. And these are the first fruits, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, mm -hmm. of those who are redeemed from the earth. And as we know in the type, the first fruits represent a token of the harvest. Yeah. So the 140 and 4,000 as a who will live to see Christ when he comes a second time will be a token of the entire harvest of the redeemed. These are the ones who, in the final analysis, will live in the sight of a holy God without committing sins and by so doing demonstrate the success of Christ's mission in cleansing his people from sin so that they will no longer sin and will demonstrate that the devil has no place among them and by so doing effectively leading Satan out of the camp. Okay, so um, Pauline C. <laughs> had something interesting to say. She said, the Sandra had to be cleansed. I wonder if black people caught the goat and curried it. <laughs> can't seem to get over the suffering after suffering. We need Jesus for sure. Sister Polar said, shed blood was necessary for a sin offering. Christ was a sacrificed one. In case, Christ was a sacrificed one. In the case of the scapegoat, it was the high priest, not the sinner who placed the sins on the goat, not mm -hmm. that the people. Um, she Indeed. also said that, Sins had already been taken care of by the sacrifice. Brother Jobson, Gary Jobson, said, so when Christ died, he only died for those who confessed? All right, let me respond to that. Okay, quickly, because right. it's a very important to note that Christ died for all humanity. Mm -hmm. He died for all humanity. There's a but there. Yes. Okay. But let us note how that works. So, so while you search for that, let me well, put up at the top of my head, John yes. 3, 16. 16. <laughs> right. God yes. so loved God the world, so loved the world that, he gave, that he gave his, his own, only so, begotten so son that whosoever, whosoever believeth should not perish. That's right. So mm -hmm. whosoever believeth, believe those it. are the ones that will lay claim that's to the correct. sacrifice that has been made. Yes. And that's therefore correct. they will confess. That's correct. So it's for those who have confessed or will confess. Yes. I will confess rather. Right. Okay, go on, go on. And I'm also saying that there's another dimension to it in terms of the sin that brought condemnation upon all humanity. Adam, when he sinned, listen what the Bible says about Adam when he sinned. Romans 5 and verse 18. It says, therefore, as by the offense of one, mm -hmm. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. How many? All. all. To condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So, there is a benefit to all humanity in Christ's death. And it is spoken of in the same chapter, um, Romans chapter 5, earlier where it says, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were, this is past tense, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, 
we shall be saved by his life. Now, there's a reconciliation element mm -hmm. that everyone benefits from. If Christ had not pledged his life at the very beginning, and Satan was allowed to take charge of us and the entire territory the moment Adam sinned, then we would not be here. But by virtue of the fact that Christ took it upon himself to stand in our place, we are here today having the opportunity not to be judged by the fact that Adam had sinned. Christ having reconciled us to God by his death basically bought us all back and given us freedom from the devil. We are now free from that condemnation, all of us, bar none, so that in believing on Christ, we have the opportunity to be judged by our own deeds. So, by our own decision, by our own choice, and not left condemned by virtue of the fact that Adam had sinned and brought condemnation upon all humanity. So, so, for, so for both of you know, and, and I'm more inclined to throw this over to, to yes. Dr. McLennan, yes. um, I'm looking at it from the point of view that Adam willfully sin yes that was a prison so two sins were committed there mm -hmm. you have one that was that seemingly based on how the bible puts it unintentional so she was deceived mm -hmm. but then there was another that was presumptuous yes. all right and christ died for all yes. but because that christ willfully died for all our sins we therefore have to willfully lay hold we have to willfully go out and believe yes on that so yes. so i'm thinking that he has no intention a violating our free will. Right. So it therefore no. means John 3.16 is the greatest condition that has ever been laid before Ex That us. is exactly what the What are word. you using that? So that yes, it is, that is exactly the, 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 the right word, condition. It is conditional. Conditional on us accepting that gift that God has given us through Jesus Christ. In fact, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. So the condition is if we confess our sins. So yes, it is, it is freely available according to John 3.16. Yes. And, and by extension, John 3.17. Freely available to us. But we have to exercise that power of choice, which God will not violate, as we have seen from Eden. He did not violate Adam and Eve's power of choice. Already knowing that they would sin, he did not step in ahead, but he allowed the entire universe of angels and for Adam and Eve and for all humanity who would come up subsequently to see that it was Eve's choice and then Adam's choice. Another point I would like to raise is Ephesians, in Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 where it speaks about by grace we are saved through faith. An important part of that passage it says that it is the gift of God, which simply means that again, we have the choice to accept this gift. It is not mandated upon us um, or forced upon us. Um, gifts are really, if, it is, if they are to be given in the true sense of what gifts are supposed to be, it's supposed to be presented um, as a free will, as well as to be accepted freely. And Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 really highlights the fact that faith is a gift from God. Again, highlighting our power of choice. So yes, it is conditional. Our, 
our salvation is conditioned upon our accepting um, Jesus' gift and our choice to confess our sins. Oh, I think we are at the end of, of tonight's program. Um, I think it's cruel for me to say that time sure flies when you have fun. <laughs> so, so we are still looking at the topic of salvation by faith. I am uncertain how many of your questions would have been um, answered. I know that we have a few that have been addressed here. And, um, and so we typically throw it out to, to the panelists and, and, and ask if they would be willing or able to sit and complete um, another, well, the rest of the question at another sitting. So this is where I, I hold them accountable <laughs> in our strong arm in front of all of you um, there in cyberspace. Strong man of Israel. Whether or not you guys would have been available for, for another, for another um, Monday, another Monday night to sit with our audience and and complete this particular study. You know, this is where I look over yeah. to both of you and ask if you you think. You think you'll be able to? Yes. Unfortunately, I won't be available next week, Monday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I would certainly okay. be happy to participate further in this conversation, yes. which is so yes. critical, you know? Yes, yes, it is. And, you know, without mm -hmm. derailing the thought, I, I, I just have to support <laughs> the last point that Elder McLennan made mm -hmm. by Romans 12 and verse 3, where it says, God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. Amen. So faith itself is a gift. Yes. Well, I think you should yes. read that slowly. Yes. I think yes. you should read that yes. slowly. Romans 12 and verse 3. Mm -hmm. God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay. So, perfect. And so, just as Peter said in Peter's ladder, ladder add to your faith. Yes. yes. Virtue. So everyone has a measure of faith faith to start with yes. but, and therefore it is possible what? for every individual to lay claim on to that. lay claim but, but why do you search for that, on that faith why do you search yes. for that though i'm just looking at how how god is and the fact that the thing that we need to, to be saved yes he had to give it to us yes so not the sacrifice he has made the sacrifice Yes. Um, not the grace, he has provided the grace, yes. but the faith that we need to claim the grace that he gives in the sacrifice, he had to also give that. So he yes. had to literally give us Everything. every single thing yes. that we need to be saved. So it therefore means that there is absolutely no one who can be saved or lost without their own action or inaction. That is correct. And I, I, I always use the example of the, the rain mm -hmm. and the crops. Mm -hmm. God causes the rain to fall on the evil and the good, and on the good, and cause the sun to shine on the just and, the, and on the unjust. When the rain falls, it causes the crops to grow. Yes. Everyone benefits. But guess what? It does not absolve us of the need to prepare the soil and to plant the seed and to play our part. And so God has given everyone a measure of faith. But he says in first Peter, second Peter chapter one, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith yes. virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity or love. Amen. God is love. Amen. And so the ultimate yeah. of what God seeks to inculcate in us is love. But we must exercise the faith that he has given us to add to it yes. the virtues that he so freely empowers us to have developed in us mm -hmm. by the gift of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Amen. 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 So, oh. <laughs> you, you wanted to go ahead? Yes, yeah, I just wanted to, very, very quickly, as Prophet brought the imagery of farming, 
and Jesus himself had said it, that he is the true vine in John 15. Yes. And verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the, in the vine. vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So Indeed. as you said, Elder Thomas, we, we have to get everything from God in order to please God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So during our discussion, we had so many comments. Um, thank you for your comments, um, everyone. Uh, let me just quickly run through, and then we will wrap up. So in relation to your, your um, answer, uh, Sister Puller said, note that the high priest would have completed his work before the ritual involving the scapegoat is performed. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, John Phillips also said, Revelations 20, verse 2, is he the fit man question. and angel. So we can't answer, so answer that yet. Yeah, we can't answer that yet. <laughs> so that was answered <laughs> yes. to some extent. Um, Brother Godfrey said, the scapegoat, the scapegoat is in type and, and shadow pointing, pointing to Christ. To Christ. A careful reading and understanding of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 11 to 13 will answer for us why the scapegoat represents Christ, not Satan. I guess we'll look at that one the next we time. We can look at that next time, yes. yes. Um, Brother Jobson said, So his death is for those who have or will, past and future, confessed. Yes. Thank God for John three sixteen. Amen. Um, Pauline C. said, Jesus is a gentleman. He does not force anyone. He invites us to cast our cares upon him. If we don't do this, we, he cannot carry or bear, or bear our cares and sins. We must confess for him to carry the burden of our sins. And yeah. Phil Chavez says, oh, he wants us to pray for him. <laughs> yes. Um, Sister Patel, Patel, Patel Petty says, I thank God for the life and death, for the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, God is love. Ends. God is love, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So before we actually close, I want us to, um, I want you to help me wish our producer. One of our, one one of of our, our producers. Persons back, back screen. Um, yes. Behind, behind the behind scenes. Behind the screen, yes. Kamaya, a happy, happy birthday. All right, so... Hallelujah, gentlemen. You can wish her happy birthday <laughs> first. Wonderful. Happy birthday, Kamoya. I trust that you had a wonderful day and that God will bless you and prosper you so that you'll live to see many more happy ones. I too would like to register my, my greetings and wishes, best wishes to you, Kamoya. Very, very happy birthday to you and hope you live to see many more not only happy ones, but healthy ones. Yes, um, indeed. As, as we all look toward Jesus' second coming. Indeed. So, and, I, and I think I want to take this opportunity, like both gentlemen here, to register my thanks, but also to say thanks specifically for your commitment um, to, to the program. Um, those of you, you have never seen her, but she's young. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, not, it's not every day that you find someone who is young commit um, and you are consistently you consistently show up and you consistently try to add value to the program so that what our guests see on, the, on their TV screens is as a result of the hard work of you and your leadership to the team. So happy birthday and may God continue to bless and to keep you all um, in all your pursuits. All right. So without further ado, um, we won't sing Happy Birthday, we'll just, <laughs> <laughs> just pray. I think I'll, I'll ask, um, yes, the, new, the newest person on the block to just pray for us. And um, sure. while you're praying, you can just throw in a little thing for um, Kamaya as Sister well. Kamaya. And, uh, and ask that Phil's petition be, be granted to him according to God, um, God's abundance or providence. So that's it. So over to you. It's a prayer, man. Thank you. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have loved us so much. You have made preparations for us long before we even needed 
these special plans and special provisions. We thank you, Lord, that you have been our ultimate sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to protect us, to guide us, and to redeem us back to you. Dear Lord, thank you for the insights that you have given us in this session. We ask, Lord, that you may deepen our interests, strengthen our faith. And all those who have watched online, we ask, Lord, that you may let your word come alive in their hearts and ultimately to transform us all and make us a people ready for your second coming. Thank you, Lord, for Ella Thomas and the team who continue to do this great work. We ask that you may continue to bless them, bless their efforts, bless the equipment, and bless all those who will continue to tap into this great resource. Bless Professor Colin Giles as well, and his family, in all of his endeavors. We thank you for the insight and the sharpness with which he divides the word and shares the word. We also pray for Sister Kumaya a little. We thank you that she has seen another birthday. We ask the Lord that you may continue to enrich her life spiritually and temporally. We ask that you may help her to continue to grow in grace and in favor with God and man. We ask that you may give her many more happy birthdays and healthy birthdays so that she will continue to live for you and be a blessing to her family and all that she comes in contact with. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Continue to bless us and continue to keep us unto that day when you shall put in your appearance. Forgive us of our sins, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, again, we just want to thank you for um, taking the time out to allow us into your spaces. Um, continue to like, comment, subscribe, and share the ministry that is walking in his word. And you as you continue to walk, I leave you with Hebrews, uh, well, sorry, not Hebrews tonight. I leave you with a regular verse of scripture, which is taken from Proverbs 4, verse 18. That says, but the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Mm -hmm. Until such time, when we meet again, I am Kwame Thomas, one of your local leaders in the Andrews District of Churches, and this has been Walking in His Word. Do have a good night. Going back and